Okay, test, test, how are we sounding? Great, looks like we can move ahead. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us today in this live online session. Uh, very pleased to be serving as your co-host. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Anharad Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP and very pleased to be welcoming everyone to this fourth session in the series of PHAP's and ICFA's learning stream on humanitarian coordination, focusing on the opportunities and challenges challenges for OCHA and national and international NGOs to work together in order to improve coordination during a humanitarian response. I also want to start off by mentioning that this event is made possible by the generous support of ICVA as well as part of the Geneva Humanitarian Connector, an initiative of PHAP supported by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, working to facilitate meaningful, outcome-oriented professional exchange both among humanitarian actors in Geneva and, important between Geneva and the rest of the global humanitarian community. Um, also very pleased to be co-hosting uh, today with Emmanuel Osmond, Senior Policy Officer with ICVA. Yeah, greetings to everyone and welcome on uh, this session. Okay, excellent. So great to see such a crowd of people joining us today. We have, I see, already more than 100 people in this virtual room joining from Nigeria, Pakistan, Turkey, Jordan, Somalia. Uh, I think over 100 countries uh, actually represented today. So thanks, everyone, for making the time uh, to join this interactive discussion. So now, introducing the substance of today's session. Uh, let's, uh, first of all, um, our guest experts will explore the opportunities for NGOs to engage with OCHA under OCHA's core functions, uh, looking at how NGOs can better work with OCHA mechanisms during a humanitarian response, and we'll also address challenges faced by NGOs in the field and their lessons learned to improve partnership and coordination with OCHA. And now I'll turn it over to Emmanuel to uh, briefly introduce our guest speakers. Yes, today we have uh, four guest speakers, and our first speaker will be Loretta Heber Girardet, and she's the chief of OCHA's intercluster coordination section in Geneva here in Switzerland. And she will uh, provide us with a global overview of OCHA's roles and mandate as the leading UN coordination body in humanitarian context. Then Jan Ridley, who is the head of office of OCHA in South Sudan, is going to provide us with a perspective of OCHA's engagement with NGOs at country level. Jan has worked also with NGOs in the field and his experience and tips, uh, will, he will share them today with us and it will give us an insight of, on how NGOs can improve engagement with OCHA at country level. Then we will have uh, Mohamed Al Hamadi, who is the coordinator of the Syrian NGO Alliance and he will uh, give us an insight uh, into how NGO forums and networks interact with the, the humanitarian coordination structures when they're working with the whole of Syria response. Finally, Wayu Kunkore, who is the Disaster Risk Management Program Manager for Plan International will be speaking on how an international NGO engages with OCHA in country on preparedness, contingency planning, and strengthening collaboration. Excellent. Thanks so much, Emmanuel. And now we will, without further ado, turn to our first guest, Laurie, uh, Chief of Intercluster Coordination Section with OCHA here in Geneva. Laurie, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be given the opportunity this morning to talk about uh, OCHA's role in humanitarian coordination and how we may engage better with NGOs. I have been asked to give an overview of uh, what OCHA does and our core functions. So I would maybe just like to start by reminding everyone how OCHA came about. In December 1991, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted Resolution 46182 that aimed to strengthen strengthen the UN response to complex emergencies and to natural disasters. And this resolution led to the creation of a high-level position known as the Emergency Relief Coordinator. Shortly thereafter, the Department of Humanitarian Affairs was established, and in 1998, this Department of Humanitarian Affairs became OCHA. Our mission is to mobilize and coordinate effective and principled action in partnership with national and international actors. We advocate for the rights of people in need, we promote preparedness and prevention, and we facilitate sustainable solutions. We are a part of the United Nations Secretariat, which is uh, now under the leadership of Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and the Emergency Relief Coordinator and Under Secretary General for OCHA is Mr. Mark Lokok, who began his functions just two weeks ago on September 1st. 
OCHA carries out its coordination function primarily through the Interagency Standing Committee, which is chaired by the Emergency Relief Coordinator. And NGOs are represented and participate at the highest levels of humanitarian policy and decision making through participation in the IASC. And currently, they are represented through three NGO consortia, uh, ICFA, the SCHR, and Interaction. So how does humanitarian coordination take place at the country level? Typically, you have a humanitarian coordinator who is often the resident coordinator of the United Nations system. The humanitarian country team is comprised of the senior leaders of the UN, but also NGO community. And currently, at least 72% of HCTs have at least one national NGO member. All of them have international NGO members. So NGOs play a very important role at the field level. Um, we also have intercluster coordination teams. And these intercluster coordination teams are comprised of the cluster coordinators. <clears throat> cluster coordinators may be UN staff. They may also be the staff of NGOs. And increasingly, we are seeing um, NGOs playing more of a leadership role. And we can talk a little bit more about that and the importance that we see at OCHA of NGOs really engaging in the clusters and taking more of a role in strategic decision making. So just to go back to what does OCHA do, we have five core functions. Our mandate is functions around coordination, policy, advocacy, information management, and humanitarian financing. And you may be aware that OCHA has recently gone through a change management process. The aim of this change management process was to gather feedback from many operational partners and to really take a look at how OCHA was adding value to the overall humanitarian system. And the change management process offered an opportunity for many of our um, collaborators and partners to express their views on what they would like to see OCHA do. And the overarching message that we received is that OCHA really does need to focus on these five core functions and that it needs to realign its capacity and its efforts so that we are really um, delivering as best we can on these five core functions. So moving forward, our strategic planning for the future will be very much about enhancing the work that we do in each of these areas. And I'd like to go through these one by one. So obviously, um, coordination, it's in our name. It's our primary function. And our role is really to make sure that humanitarian actors come together to ensure a coherent response to emergencies. We pay a critical role in assessing situations and needs and monitoring progress and mobilizing funds. Um, we seek to ensure that the right structure, the right partnerships, and the right leaders are in place and supported so that they can better prepare for and have more effective coordination humanitarian situations. Our coordination function is beyond serving as the secretariat for the IASC. We also manage rapid response tools such as UNDAC, which is the UN Disaster Assessment and Coordination System, as well as the INSERAC, which is the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group. And we also carry out civil military coordination. So one of our our key coordination tools is the humanitarian program cycle, which aims to bring together cluster sectors and agencies to have a joint approach to understanding what the needs are, agreeing on the priorities for the response, and monitoring the effectiveness of the overall response. So our key role is really to deploy rapid response team to set up coordination of new emergencies, to put in place the appropriate architecture, to help governments and actors access the tools and services that they need, to support the assessment, to agree on priorities. And a critical part of our work is to facilitate the overarching humanitarian response plan that lays out the strategy for responding to the needs of the population. So OCHA is the coordinator of the IASC cluster system, which was uh, set up in the two following the 2005 earthquake in Pakistan. And the clusters are where we see great participation from NGOs. The clusters have uh, six major functions, which are around supporting service delivery, informing the strategic decision making by carrying out assessments and analysis, carrying out the planning, carrying out advocacy to address uh, issues of concern to cluster participants and affected population, monitoring reporting, contingency planning, and also early recovery. I might uh, mention as well that the 
clusters also have a responsibility to ensure that cross-sectoral issues such as gender and protection mainstreaming and accountability to affected people are present throughout the response. Moving on with OCHA's core functions, a critical area of work relates to policy. And here, OCHA helps set the agenda of policy makers. We try to rally humanitarian actors around current and emerging concerns. We also engage with member states to strengthen the legal basis for humanitarian action, and we provide expert advice on issues related to the protection we also aim to advance humanitarian norms through intergovernmental processes. Therefore, we carry out briefings to the General Assembly, the Security Councils, and we also host the annual ECOSOC Humanitarian Affairs segment. OCHA's job on advocacy is to make sure world attention is focused on humanitarian issues. And we use a range of channels and platforms uh, in order to make sure that the world is seized of the issues that are impacting people affected by humanitarian crises. These may be public uh, channels, such as media interviews or public speeches. But also, a lot of our advocacy work is carried out privately. It's quiet discussions that aim to uh, bring um, better access, for example, to partners. This includes negotiations, for example, with armed groups. We also very much support advocacy at the field level as well. And our overarching goal is to always promote the principles of humanity, neutrality, independence, and impartiality. And finally, a word about information management. As I mentioned before, during the change management process, OCHA's uh, um, partners were consulted about our added value. And overwhelmingly, they felt that OCHA's work on information management was critically important. Our job is to collect and analyze information so that we can provide a holistic overview of uh, needs, gaps, and responses in protracted and acute uh, emergencies. Humanitarian financing. Um, we manage two types of pooled funds. The first is the Central Emergency Response Fund, the SURF, and country-based pool funds. And they aim to provide timely funding for life-saving activities. Uh, under OCHA stewardship, the SURF provides a rapid initial funding at the outset of humanitarian crisis and critical support for underfunded emergencies worldwide. In the country-based pool funds allocate funding based on identified humanitarian needs and priorities at the country level. Allocations go to UN agencies, IOM, national and international NGOs, as well as the Red Cross and Red Crescent organizations for the pool funds. Finally, a word about OCHA and NGOs. We believe that NGOs are absolutely critical for the overall humanitarian response. And we are a great advocate for greater NGO participation in coordination and to strengthen NGOs' response capacity. We are seeking to strengthen NGOs' access to full funds, in particular national NGOs. We also provide training for NGOs on how to participate more effectively in coordination. And at the field level, OCH is promoting NGO participation on HCTs and as co-facilitators of the clusters as well. Much of what we are doing um, has been brought to the attention of the world through the global, through the World Humanitarian Summit and the Grand Bargain, specifically localization of humanitarian response. And here we are seeking to really strengthen the localization of humanitarian response. We have been tracking participation of NGOs in coordination systems, and we note that national NGO participation is increasing on the HCTs, as mentioned before, from 62% three years ago to over 75% today that NGO access to pool funds has increased from 14% in 2014 to 22% today, and that uh, national NGOs and NGOs make up by far the greatest um, number of participants in coordination systems in the ground. And maybe we can talk a bit further about that. <clears throat> it's not just the participation. Where we really have to do more and what we're aiming to achieve is making sure that NGOs have a greater voice in decision making in coordination in the future moving ahead. So I will leave it there, and uh, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. We actually have a uh, follow-up question uh, that's come in during uh, during your presentation. Um, so this is specifically uh, regarding the issue of the reform of the resident coordinator system. Um, so as you mentioned, the Secretary General is planning to reform the resident coordinator system. And the question uh, is, how could this impact the HC HCT system? Well, the reform process is currently uh, being carried out right now. 
now, and uh, so we are not quite sure of how and what the final picture would be. But the issue on the table is really to ensure that the that the entire um, UN system at the field level is more coherent and that uh, the RC, the resident coordinator, is in a better position to make decisions and to work in a manner which leverages all of the different competencies and capacities and resources of the UN system at a country level. So we, it's a bit still wait and see, but certainly um, OCHA is seized of the issue and is heavily engaged in the conversations to ensure that the reform process um, ends up with a system that meets the needs of not only development actors, but also humanitarian actors. Um, and we're very confident that the vision that the new Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has for the future of the UN system, including the resident coordinator, um, will achieve its intended goal, which is really to streamline the UN and to make better use of the resources that are made available to it while empowering the resident coordinator to make the types of decisions that are required so that we're in a better position to support people in need. Excellent. Thanks so much. And it'll uh, be interesting as well to hear uh, to hear potentially the views of some of our other uh, guests on this, uh, on this big question coming up. Um, but now we'll move to our next presentation coming from Ian Ridley. Um, so Ian, head of office with OCHA in South Sudan, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you very much, Angarad, and uh, greetings, colleagues. I'm uh, delighted to be able to uh, talk to uh, NGO colleagues across the world, particularly as uh, the vast majority of my experience uh, in the humanitarian world is indeed with NGOs. I've been with OCHA uh, now a, a little over a year. So I've just got uh, five points to share with you on uh, tips for engagement uh, from my perspective uh, now as a head of OCHA, but certainly from uh, my time with NGOs when I was involved in, in quite a lot of interagency work. The first thing I would say is that it's important for NGOs when they engage with OCHA and indeed the, the whole UN system uh, to be confident. Uh, NGOs have a lot to offer. In South Sudan, uh, where I'm working right now, NGOs deliver approximately 80% of all the services, the humanitarian services that are delivered in country. So it's vital that the NGO voice is heard around the table. Uh, NGOs uh, have dedicated and smart staff uh, and they should be treated as equals uh, per the principles of, of partnership. If you're not familiar with the principles of partnership, I'd uh, encourage you to uh, look up that document and, and have a read, and that should encourage you to demand the, the respect that you deserve. And particularly here, I want to appeal to our, our national NGO colleagues who have a, a knowledge of the local context, which is, is rich and uh, needs to be shared with those of us that come in from outside who perhaps don't have uh, that very intimate understanding of the context and, and can therefore make mistakes as we go along. So the first point is to uh, have the confidence that, that your position and your role uh, in the system uh, compels you uh, to have. The, the next point that I would make is to be engaged. And the reason I make this point is that coordination is hard work, it's, it's time consuming, and sometimes I hear people say, it's a lot of meetings. I don't have time to go to meetings. Uh, some of the meetings are uh, not that interesting or I don't get much out of them. They're, they're repetitive. All of those things, of course, can be true. But it's also true that the more you invest in coordination, the better things will be for you both individually and uh, for your organization. The, the return that you get from engaging in coordination systems is greater uh, the more time and effort that you invest yourself. And some of the areas where you can invest, and uh, they've been uh, referenced already, uh, co-leadership uh, of clusters, either at the, the national or the uh, sub-national level, uh, is an important role for, that NGOs can play. Uh, being on the humanitarian country team, uh, and I should mention here that uh, in South Sudan, where I currently, currently serve, we have five uh, NGO slots on the humanitarian country team. Uh, it's up to the NGO forum how they uh, assign those slots. Uh, I see there are questions about the representation of uh, national NGOs on the HCT. Certainly in South Sudan, the uh, NGO forum uh, allocates one or two of those five seats uh, to uh, national NGOs, and they play a, a very critical role on our uh, HCT. 
Another area for engagement is the country-based pool fund uh, advisory board. Again, in South Sudan, we have two NGO seats uh, on the advisory board. And of course, participation in task teams or working groups that are, are looking at specific issues. Uh, having the NGO uh, representation around the table at that level is, is absolutely uh, critical. I would say that for me, one of the measures of uh, success for, for my office, whether I think we're doing uh, a good job or not when it comes to coordination, is the number of people uh, coming in and out of our compound to attend these various meetings and, and other meetings that we hold. Uh, I think it's uh, people aren't going to come to meetings if, if they don't add value. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm always looking at is how well attended uh, are the meetings. Uh, the, the better attended they are, clearly the more value uh, they are adding. Uh, nobody wants to go to a meeting that's uh, wasting their time. Recognizing uh, that there will be times when the agenda or the subject at hand isn't one that is of core importance to you, uh, but it's important to stay around the table uh, and build the relationship. The next point is on, on preparation. I think this one is absolutely critical. It's important that you know your brief, in other words, your, your sector, your organization, that you understand the context well, and that you understand uh, challenges. And as you prepare to engage in the various coordination mechanisms, it's important that people from individual organizations engage in conversations for the good of the sector or the community or the response, however you'd like to look at it, uh, that you don't just come with your NGO hat on and the particular drivers that your organization uh, gives you, uh, that you take a, a broader view of your participation uh, for the, the good of the, the whole. Um, it's important to do your pre-work. Uh, I'll come back to this in a moment. A lot of that uh, is done informally, uh, meetings before meetings or after meetings, uh, having coffee or, or drinks with people uh, during the workday or, or after the workday, uh, particularly uh, those of us that are in the field meeting up on the, on the weekends. Uh, those are opportunities where we can get lots of work done before an actual formal meeting, and it's important to take full advantage of those. In terms of NGO engagement, for example, on the HCT, I would say it's important to strive for, for continuity. Or if you can't achieve continuity as a group, then a good handover. Uh, this is a, a particular uh, challenge we face in uh, South Sudan with a large number of NGOs present. We have a lot of rotation on the HCT from the NGO community. And it's very important that uh, uh, if we look at the donor community and the UN community, uh, they're represented at the head of agency, head of organization level. And so it's the same people around the table week after week after week, in fact, month after month and even year after year. They therefore build relationships uh, through being present with each other uh, over a, a long period of time. And it's with that in mind that I say NGOs might want to consider striving for continuity of representation rather than sharing the representation out uh, across the range of organizations. The next is to be propositional. Uh, I did get a question whether propositional is a word. I, I think it is, but if it isn't, please don't blame me if, if somebody tells you you've used it wrongly. Um, I apologize for that in advance. But what I mean by, by being propositional is to come with ideas and innovations. Come to meetings with, with solutions uh, rather than, than questions uh, and problems. Uh, lift your head up and, and look at the, the problems that are three, six, 12 months down the line, uh, not just the problems that you're, you're facing today. And critically, don't assume that the UN or the donors have better information or answers uh, than you do. Uh, you know your sector, your geographical area, uh, your country, for those of you uh, uh, working in, in, in the country of your origin, you know it often far better than UN colleagues, donor colleagues. Uh, so use that knowledge, uh, use that information, use that rich expertise that you have uh, when you come to the table with uh, suggestions and, and innovations and, and ideas. Finally, a tough one, uh, alignment uh, across the sector. So I worked for over two decades in the NGO sector, and I, I, I know that it's very, very difficult to consider alignment uh, among NGOs. It's a big challenge. Um, it's important, I think, for the NGO community to try and seek as much agreement as they can on issues that are being discussed uh, before, for example, uh, an HCT meeting. Um, that's not always going to be possible, uh, but it's absolutely critical to try not to, to uh, disagree with each other vehemently inside the 
HCT meeting to, to have discussions where you can settle differences or, or, or air different opinions uh, in, a, in a different forum. Um, and it's important, therefore, not to come into uh, an HCT or a, a cluster meeting or a, a country-based pool fund meeting, uh, not to come in sweating the small stuff, as we say, or uh, not wanting to, to die on the hill over every issue that, that's being discussed, to keep the big picture in mind. And sometimes that means that we have to give up on what we hold dear and tight uh, with regards to our agency mandate or even our, our individual uh, opinions and, and positions on issues. Finally, I'd say it's important as we get around the table to, to talk and discuss and reach agreement uh, on the, the, the direction that we're heading as a community, the priorities that we have in delivery of humanitarian assistance. It's important to remember why we're there. And it's important to remind each other why we're there. And I think NGOs play a, a critical role in this. If we go back to the South Sudan example, 80% of deliveries done by uh, NGOs. They have uh, hundreds and thousands of staff uh, on the ground, and it's uh, it's a, a very rich experience for those of us based in the capital uh, to be able to listen to those staff uh, talk about the realities on the ground, the realities of, of delivering, the realities of the, the context that we're facing and the, the various challenges that are uh, in front of us. So going back to the, the confidence, I think that's a particular role that, that NGOs can play. Keep our feet on the ground and remind us uh, why we're there. We're not there to hold meetings. We're there to provide humanitarian assistance uh, to people in need. So to sum up, I'd say as you uh, engage across the various uh, meetings and fora, large and small, and indeed with individuals in the system, um, recognize that building relationships is important. Uh, consistency of representation is good. Uh, the role of informal meetings is absolutely critical, and that it's about uh, give and take. Uh, seeking uh, agreement on priorities and the way forward uh, is often about the best compromise that, that we can achieve given agency mandates and individual opinions. And that's a, a critical part of our role in coordination then is to help people understand when to uh, give up on close-held uh, beliefs and positions for the greater good. And just remembering uh, the reason we're there is to serve uh, people in need fundamentally. So let me stop there and uh, thank you for your time and I look forward to uh, taking your questions later. Thank you very much, Ian. And I, I believe that in your presentation, you struck several important chords uh, with the audience here today. Uh, just looking quickly at the results of the poll, um, we asked participants uh, which of these factors that you described they thought their organization would need to work on the most. And by far, topping the list uh, was proactivity, uh, being proactive or being uh, propositional in your word, Ian. So I think really struck a chord with that. It was closely followed by uh, being engaged. Um, so very interesting uh, to see that uh, as well reflected um, in the, the sentiment of the group. Uh, I believe uh, my co-host has a follow-up question for you, so I'll give the floor to Emmanuel. Yes, thank you, Anharad. Um, just this is to understand also the range of activities that OCHA is covering in, uh, in country. So how would you describe the typical day uh, thank of you, the Emmanuel. head of OCHA? Uh, my, my typical day is a series of meetings. Um, I often start the day with uh, a meeting my senior team or with uh, individual staff who may have uh, questions or, or want to discuss something. And the day then goes into a, a series of meetings, uh, often with uh, members of government uh, in South Sudan. That's with the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and the Re Relief and Rehabilitation uh, Commission. Uh, we have a series of statutory meetings uh, in, in, in the UN. Uh, I'm an observer on the UN country team. We have, of course, the humanitarian country team uh, that meets every week. Uh, because we're in a mission context, I find myself uh, meeting with mission colleagues frequently to explain uh, humanitarian activities and to explain the importance and, and criticality of principled humanitarian action. Um, individual meetings take up uh, a significant part of the day, uh, either with uh, UN agencies or um, NGO colleagues, particularly at the country director level. Uh, visitors that come into town uh, from NGOs often want to meet with OCHA to get OCHA's perspectives. Of course, meetings with donors uh, and then uh, informal meetings, uh, whether that's uh, lunch or, or after work with uh, all of those uh, stakeholder groups. I try and squeeze in um, email uh, through the day, uh, but that normally has to wait for the, the evening or the, the, the early morning. And of course, I try and meet with the humanitarian coordinator uh, very regularly, either by phone or at least 
two or three times a week uh, face to face in addition to the um, HCT meeting. As well as meetings, uh, I spend a fair bit of time on the phone, uh, either with, with headquarters uh, or uh, sometimes I take calls on specific issues from uh, country directors of, of NGOs in country, particularly when they're facing a security challenge uh, or we're doing a, a staff relocation because of conflict uh, uh, so I'll often talk with the country director to make sure that the service that we're providing to that organization the coordination function that that, that we fulfill uh, is is meeting their needs and, and now and again uh, I'm also asked to, to speak to the media and so in between all of those meetings and calls, I try to keep up to date on what's happening in the sector re by reading briefs and uh, reading the news. And I have to say, uh, in my context, I find Twitter uh, probably one of the most helpful sources of uh, real-time information. So uh, that's how I spend my day in a, a series of meetings, uh, snatching the, the odd uh, email and, and opportunity for reading in between. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Ian. Uh, a day in the life. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Um, we're now going to move uh, to our next guest speaker. Very pleased to have on the line with us today Mohammed Al uh, Al uh who is coordinator of the Syrian NGO Alliance. Uh, so, Mohammed, do we have you still on the line there? Thank you, Ankar. Uh, so, this is Mohammed from the Syrian NGO Alliance. I'm the coordinator of an alliance of Syrian or local NGOs, um, uh, 20 of them, uh, working uh, mainly from Turkey Hub uh, to cr cross for cross border operations into Syria. So in Syria we have a unique uh, coordination mechanism where we have like three cross-border, uh, official cross-border operations from Jordan and Turkey and then we have, have the, the regular uh, response from the Masters Hub uh, in Syria. So the Syrian NGO Alliance is a member of the whole of Syria strategic steering group and also the uh, Northern Syria Hub humanitarian liaison group. Both of them are humanitarian country teams uh, but, orient uh, but uh, their QRs are oriented to adapt to the Syrian context. Uh, SNA also is a member of the inter coordination groups for cross-border response from Turkey and the whole of Syria level as well. Before the Syrian NGO Alliance and other local NGO networks exist, uh, local NGO's role was marginal, uh, like like that, uh, three or four years ago. Uh, even direct communication with local NGO's was happening through the NGO forum, which is an NGO uh, dominant platform. Next slide. Uh, the SNA and OCHA fight for, fun for functions. I will just go briefly uh, about the engagement and the interaction with OCHA uh, according to its fight uh, for uh, fight for functions. Uh, first of all is coordination. Um, you know, um, as I said, establishing the Syrian Alliance and later other networks was a turning point in the engagement of Syrian NGOs in decision making. Syrian NGOs now have four seats in northern Syria or, have, uh, or Turkey have uh, HTT, which was which is called the HLG, and we have also three out of six uh, seats for NGOs. So we have six uh, seats for NGOs in the whole of Syria. SSG, uh, we have three for senior NGOs, one of them is also for SNA. Also at cluster level, uh, senior NGOs in Turkey call it uh, three clusters, um, but nothing yet at the whole senior level. At, um, for policies, um, NGOs participated in developing many policy documents for the response. For example, can we have the joint operational protocol in 2015 was developed and now recently the principles of engagement with civilian administrations in Syria. So also uh, OSHA plays a role and here supported the NGOs to actively participate in different policy and decision-making platforms. Humanitarian financing, uh, I think uh, OSHA played a significant role through old funding, uh, pa uh, participated in building the capacities of local NGOs and enabling them. Um, at cluster level as well, Syrian NGOs are active members of technical review committees, uh, strategic advisory groups uh, as well. Uh, advocacy. Uh, this part needs to be uh, improved. I, we believe uh, there's a feeling that there more needs to be done here. It's, uh, with all uh, the briefings, uh, I think it's known that the RT briefings to the Security Council, uh, UN Security Council, uh, we, we still think that there is more to be done uh, for the advocacy, for the needs and the protection of civilians, especially humanitarian access uh, in Syria. Information management uh, is one of the main issues that Syrian NGOs and OSHA needs also to, to, to also much um, more improvement need to be done here. 
most part of the data collection from the field is done by the Syrian NGOs, by the local NGOs, while we really don't uh, exist, uh, almost don't exist in the uh, information analysis and producing reports of this. I, I think I went through the ch some of the challenges, but I will also uh, highlight some of them through uh, going through recommendations. For NGOs, what I will provide here is, is, is I think, important to more engage and network and coordinate. For engagement, I would say that don't think to create your own systems for your response. And this is for local NGOs specifically. It will consume your power and resources. Local NGOs should avoid duplicating OCHA efforts. This is what we have noticed sometimes. Uh, noticed sometimes. So rather, we, we should find a way to engage and best use OCHA resources and experiences to move our response. Uh, networking. Uh, uh, also, don't try to work alone. In any response, there are many local NGOs, as I'm saying that specifically for local NGOs. You need to sit with them, discuss, and agree on common strategies. You will you 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 will be uh, unable to see the full picture alone as a local NGO. So you need to sit with other NGOs, local NGOs, and see the whole picture together. Coordination. So do you uh, do your own coordination as well. Harmonize your use with other local actors. Again, you are too many. So the local NGOs are too many. They are not like hundred, not ten or twenty NGOs. Usually, we have hundreds of, of of local NGOs. So don't expect OSHA to be able to reach to each and every one of you and hear all your voices. Uh, here, here, here comes the rule of coordination. You need to coordinate with your local partners, harmonize your voices together, agree on what is the most important issues and what is feasible. That's what was yeah, I'm talking about repositioning as well, and then talk to OSHA. Advocacy. It's not enough to do all the above. You will need to advocate for your needs, for your views. Um, it's true that you uh, know your country and people more than everyone, but you shouldn't expect that uh, you can achieve more than 10% from direct meetings. So you need to be innovative and find your ways to advocate for your ideas to improve the response. And here also comes your role as well uh, to remember everyone that these are the people that you need to uh, serve. Finally, uh, for OSHA, I have uh, small points here. About the language first one, I believe OCHA should use the language of the first responder in, uh, responders in coordination. While interpretation could be helpful, but it's not enough. It should be it should adapt the language of the people and the first responders in co communication. That will really improve the response from our point of view. Many very, uh, especially from the local resources, from the local staff, uh, we have very good capacities who are unable to communicate and and and, and engage well with the response because they don't know the language, the English language specifically. Uh, the other point is conflict sensitivity. Um, OCHA is a role model for local NGOs, so it should be careful when you have a civil war in a country and you are hiring local staff or even those who are originally from there. Local actors and communities will end up blaming UN and OCHA. No one will differentiate between the agency and its staff. And that's an important point as well to take care when you have a civil war specific like the context in Syria. Partnership for the people. What I mean here is while funding local NGOs from CUBF aims to improve the response by enabling the local actor, it should not be a target itself. Uh, this really happened with the Syrian NGOs. Tens of Syrian NGOs who have now the experience and the capacities to reach a point where they couldn't access full funding from OSHA. Uh, that was mainly for because of delays in the auditing and financial clearance, uh, which took years, and most of the NGOs reached their ceilings. And always there was a point that uh, I was just saying, okay, there are hundreds of NGOs, so tens of them have reached their ceiling, so we have still many there to work with. And here we felt that that partnership should be for improving a response for the people, a better response for the people, uh, not for partnership itself. So you don't need to partnership with hundreds of NGOs. You need to partnership with maybe specific number who have, uh, like, for after years, they would, they would have the capacities, and, and you should invest on those who have you, invest, you have invested in from the first uh, place. Uh, the localization of the coordination or localizing coordination uh, I believe uh, OSHA should assist local actors and NGOs to take the lead in coordination. Local actors have proved they are, uh, that they are not only good in finding innovative ways to access different areas and understanding the context, but also in coordination uh, for the response as well. Um,
it's important to enable actors uh, in, in, in the coordination system, uh, whether in, in the clusters, or co leading clusters, or whether even uh, in, in, in being focal points for coordination certain responses, emergencies, uh, or emergencies. Um, advocacy. Uh, OCHA, I think, needs to do more to advocate for humanitarian access and protection of civilians. Uh, because initiating and coordination preparedness and contingency planning, drawing scenarios for the events and the impacts of these uh, scenarios on humanitarian needs, uh, we should uh, we think that this should be combined with parallel advocacy plans. For example, if we have like an expected 10,000 people forced displacement for people uh, going to be displaced, like 10,000 people. While we are preparing the prepare, uh, contingency planning and uh, putting the scenarios, everything, we should not forget to advocate for these people as well, to, uh, to, to, to remain in their place in the first place, not to be forced to displace for displacement, for example, to access services in their areas. So uh, this is need to be as well, not forgotten and not be neglected. I thank you all for listening, and uh, I hope I don't have tough questions. Uh, your presentation was was very interesting indeed and I, it did generate a lot of questions. I have two now that I would like to pose to you right away before we move on. Uh, and they're, they're related in some sense, but I'll pose them separately. So first, a question from Caillou. Uh, Caillou is asking, what are some of the, uh, the mechanisms or the, the, the pressure points that, in your view, that OCHA can employ to advocate for access uh, on behalf of the larger humanitarian community? especially in the Syria context. So that's the, the first question from Kayu. What are some of the mechanisms OCHA can employ on behalf uh, of other organizations in the sector? And then the second question, this is from Rosemary, uh, asking, how should NGOs address the issue of cross-border assistance with OCHA? Is this something that only the regional office deals with, uh, or do NGOs first contact the country office where they're based? Over to you, Mohammed. So I'll start with the second one with the cross-border operations. It's, 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 no, it's not the regional office. It's more the, the field offices, it's the Turkey office and, and Jordan office, and uh, you, you need to contact with these offices first. And uh, regarding advocacy, it's one of the most complicated issues. It, 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 it was, it, we went through brainstorming and trying to find solutions how to in, to improve the advocacy, especially in the Syrian context and humanitarian access for the people. We believe that one of the things we shouldn't be neutral and impartial to the people. So, sorry, not to the people, to the conflict parties. But it might we 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 we, we might think of of being more direct with the um, uh, regulations and uh, applying. Uh, methodologies to specify and indicate who is doing what, who is violating, who is uh, obstructing humanitarian access to certain areas. So uh, putting more pressures on the on the conflict parties uh, who are violating uh, people's rights and, and obstructing humanitarian access uh, while keeping the neutrality and impartiality for the people but not for the, 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 the conflict parties. So sometimes we are very, very like sensitive to, to, to even like uh, to, 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 to keep the humanitarian access for ourselves. We, we keep a very low profile and uh, that might need to be reviewed. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move now uh, to our final guest speaker for today, Wahyu Kunshoro, Disaster Risk Management Program Manager with Plan International in Indonesia. Hello everyone, um, my name is Wahyu. I am the Disaster Risk Management for Plan International in Indonesia. I'm pleased to be able to speak on this forum to share our experience uh, in engaging with OCHA, particularly in Indonesia. Uh, maybe just want to give you a bit of background of Plan International in this uh, International in Indonesia is just starting work on emergency response since the Indian Ocean tsunami uh, hit Aceh back in 2004. So uh, we kind of like have experience responding to emergency or disasters. It's about uh, 10 or 11 years and uh, since the 2004 we kind of like uh, became one of the humanitarian organization who are involved in disaster response in Indonesia uh, 
based on the experience after several time involved uh, or engaged in emergency or disaster response in Indonesia, we found that OCHA has played a critical role on, on it and benefiting us uh, as a non-government organization such as that uh, access to reliable information on the current humanitarian situation within the country is, uh, as you know, that uh, after the disaster strike, uh, particularly uh, the natural hazard disaster strike in, in some location within your country, the information is, is quite uh, important to, to get an update uh, on on what's going on on the ground, what is the situation, what is the status of the security, the safety, and something like that. It's, it's uh, something that we, we can rely on OCHA information, uh, as mentioned on the previous information, that uh, one of the key component of OCHA is also as a information management. So uh, for, for us, uh, for plan, particularly in Indonesia, that's uh, one of the benefits if we have an engagement with, uh, with, with OCHA. And uh, the second one is access to key uh, to decision-making actors, such as government and non-government uh, actors involved in the humanitarian response. It, it is obvious that uh, when we uh, attend the, the coordination meeting that held by, by OCHA, like the, the general coordination meeting or the, in, uh, the cluster coordination meeting that held by uh, the, the lead of the cluster, I'm sure that we, we have something that we want to get more information related on when, when, when we're facing a, an issue such as like the protection issue or the wash issue. And I, I believe that based on my experience, when we came to the... In, in, we came to the coordination meeting, we, we will find the, the, the key decision making at, at the time, at least uh, if we ask to uh, OCHA colleague that leading the, the coordination uh, at the time. The third one, uh, I want to say that if we, we are engaged in a coordination meeting, those uh, even though that uh, held by OCHA or other coordination meeting, it's, uh, it gives us access to, to saving more life. Uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that OCHA having this tagline uh, coordination safe life because yes, uh, for us as a as a NGO, when we know about the the situation and and uh, what the the existing gap that uh, happened uh, during the the first phase of the emergency, then we 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 able to uh, to decide uh, or being coordinate. To, to fulfill the gap by uh, providing uh, an emergency relief at, at, at that time. And the next one is uh, maybe this is a specifically or uh, yeah, this is what we are experienced by uh, have a good coordination with, with OCHA and then uh, in Indonesia, uh, there is a there is there, there was a time that OCHA uh, like develop or set up a, a committee to uh, in country that consists of uh, INGO to reviewing the the proposal that came to OCHA to to access the emergency response funds and at that time plan was uh, one one of the committee to to review the the, the full proposal that submitted by uh, local NGO or uh, INGO uh, to to accessing the the fund for for the emergency response and the last one uh, that for, for us is benefiting uh, when when we do the coordination uh, lead by uh, OCHA we we able to have or expand our networking with uh, in country humanitarian actor this uh, might be uh, in line with uh, just previously uh, presented by Muhammad uh, regarding how uh, the the local the local NGO is being uh, self coordinated and then uh, bring the voice to the to the to the up level uh, which is in, in in the coordination meeting the general coordination meeting and how the the local uh, NGO or the national NGO can meet also with the with the international NGO during the during the coordination meeting and based on my experience with what you call uh, limited resource that. Uh, have by the international NGO, we, we also need uh, some information and support uh, by the, the the national actor or the national NGO. In Indonesia, we 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 do coordinate not only during the emergency response, but OCHA also facilitate a regular coordination to discuss about the preparedness during the develop, uh, development phase, like uh, like today. Uh, from from our point of view, that uh, having a coordination do, uh, for the prepared 
preparedness is uh, in Indonesia like we can have like fully engage in strengthening capacity of government to the development of the contingency plan, develop regulation related to humanitarian response and disaster risk reduction. This is uh, what uh, what we are uh, doing in Indonesia like uh, we supporting the National Disaster Management Agency in how uh, we gonna deal with the the large scale of of uh, emergency or uh, disaster by setting up the the scenario one until three, for instance. And it's also uh, in Indonesia we uh, we support the the government of uh, Indonesia to set up a national cluster system, which is uh, is more likely with uh, more likely like the the international cluster system, but uh, all the the cluster lead will be led by uh, our uh, ministerial level and during the uh, the preparedness uh, time also we we conduct the tabletop simulation exercise where uh, OCHA supporting the the, the national uh, government uh, to to select and to to exercise the the contingency plan also the regulation that been developed before I think this already been presented by uh, other presenters such as from Ian and Muhammad as well so this is just uh, our our uh, our experience on how we can have an effective uh, collaboration uh, in in the coordination system or mechanism that uh, uh, what you call uh, provide by by OCHA like this might in line with Ian's statement that uh, be confident. Uh, I what I saying this uh, always start with an introduction to 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 the meeting uh, to the meeting from or to the floor uh, because uh, I think in 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 last care emergency uh, there is a hundred uh, of uh, people who coming there and then uh, they will uh, doesn't know e each other so they you might need to introduce your, yourself like who 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 we are and then what what is our purpose and then then we can. And uh, have a like an informal uh, meeting after after afterwards. So uh, I think it is 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 good if we uh, can introduce uh, ourselves and uh, develop a uh, a positive uh, impression in the in the first time. And in Indonesia, maybe in also in another country, uh, I might suggest that we involve in existing network within the country uh, in. Like in Indonesia, we have like the consortium of uh, disaster education who also uh, before uh, initiate by by OCHA as a preparedness uh, consortium in 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 education sector for 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 instance. One another tip or suggestion that uh, we 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 find that it will be useful and uh, it might help you to be uh, more recognized uh, during the the emergency response or uh, or after that to to be to be proactive or lead and participate in a uh, working group or task force based on the organization mandate. This is like during the emergency, uh, somehow there is a technical uh, issue that we we not able to to discuss during the coordination uh, meeting. Then uh, somehow uh, usually OCHA colleague will open. Uh, okay, let's uh, have a task force to uh, to manage this issue, and then who will and and will uh, asking who who able to in charge for or leading the the task force. So that's my uh, good to to build your organization profile uh, in front of OCHA and of, of in front of a donor at the time maybe that if uh, they are coming to the meeting this challenge is uh, what we feel in 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 Indonesia that I know that in in Indonesia uh, OCHA is getting shrinking and shrinking that lead to the the next uh, next point on the leadership crisis in in small medium uh, emergency because uh, by the absence of OCHA uh, during the the crisis that may be happen in the uh, in the future or uh, because what I know that uh, OCHA will all only supported the the national government uh, during the the large scale of emergency in Indonesia so when we dealing with the small to medium emergencies uh, the absence of OCHA and the coordination coordination meeting that uh, led by the national government somehow it's not work and the the other one is a uh, competition of mandate among the humanitarian agency what i mean here is 
uh, during the coordination meeting there is a lot of organization that uh, probably have the same mandate of organization such as they mandate SA in health in in protection for instance or in in uh, transportation and it is uh, difficult uh, to talk to each other uh, during the coordination and therefore uh, the rule of OCHA will be uh, uh, more crucial on, on that particular issues. And the last one is uh, growing capacity of national government. This is not a kind of a challenge but also the uh, something that we should proud of but uh, again all the preparedness activity, activities that uh, already been uh, done before uh, and when it's time to what you call to, to test it I, uh, somehow we, we never know that because the, the result of the tabletop uh, simulation exercise will be have a different when, when, when we deal with the, the real scenario. Uh, that's uh, one of the uh, another challenges that uh, we might face it. I think I will stop here and then uh, we'll talk, uh, answer some questions. Okay, yes, very good. Thank you so much, Wahyu. Um, we do have some questions. Actually, most urgently, uh, we have a question of clarification, uh, I would say, coming in from a couple of people in the chat. So, uh, Dahye and Anne-Marie uh, are both asking, would you be so kind as to uh, elaborate a bit more when you say that OCHA is shrinking? Um, what do you mean by that uh, and can you explain uh, briefly uh, from from your perspective uh, what you're seeing? Thank you for the question. What I mean by shrinking is, uh, I think during the the the, the last two years, uh, OCHA has stopped to provide the emergency uh, response fund in uh, access to to emergency response fund, and it's 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 difficult for 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 us as a NGO as well when dealing with the the small to to medium scale of emergency in Indonesia because somehow it's also very difficult for us to to get a uh, a donor a donor to to fund our response because it's categorized as a small to to medium uh, scale of emergency. It it will be different when a uh, OCHA still have this kind of mechanism in in country for for this in Indonesia when we we might able to access. Uh, those fund uh, to uh, to respond uh, at least the the medium scale of emergency in in Indonesia and uh, it's also being uh, what you call it, seen that uh, more and more of OCHA colleague in Indonesia are 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 decrease uh, at the moment as far as I know is now only uh, we have only uh, one colleague uh, to deal with uh, with all the uh, activity that. OCHA usually conduct during the preparedness. Uh, for instance, like before, they have like two or three uh, people who supporting the national government in developing the contingency plan, the regulation, and etc. But currently, uh, what I understand and and what I know is there is only one person remain to this kind uh, to to do this kind of uh, activity in the country. I hope that answered the question. Very helpful. Yes, it did indeed. Thanks so much, Wahyu. So we're now going to move into our Q&A portion, and I'll ask my co-host, Emmanuel, to kick us off with a couple of questions to our guests. Over to you. Thank you, Anne Harad. And indeed, we have received a lot of questions, and uh, so uh, we'll start to answer most of them. And I will start uh, with you, Laurie, asking questions about the localization. I will ask two questions, actually. And uh, one is coming from Valeria, and she's asking, what is OCHA engagement in the localization? agenda. Currently, there are several barriers to local NGOs access in coordination platform. First, the language, but also knowledge of the system, the limited information, etc. And it goes with the second question that comes uh, from Frederic Lehoux, who is asking, could you give us, give us an overview of what OCHA is doing to bring more local NGOs into its five core functions in the spirit of localizing aid? Over to you, Laurie. So thank you for these questions. These are both um, really excellent and very timely questions. Uh, the localization agenda, which emerged from the World Humanitarian Summit, has gone really to the to the heart of um, OCHA's work on coordination. Um, it was the area of work that received the most commitments during the World Humanitarian Summit, uh, very much uh, understanding the need to reinforce and not repa replace local and national actors as we uh, set up and manage coordination structures. So a few of the things that we're doing, 
Um, we're approaching localization from two aspects. One, which is related to funding, and the second one, which is related to coordination. And I'll maybe start with coordination. Uh, our colleagues mentioned some of the challenges that we currently see in coordination. Although more than half of participants in coordination um, mechanisms are national NGOs or um, international NGOs, what we really see is that many of them do not feel that that their voices are really heard in coordination mechanisms, that they are not participating, for example, in strategic decision making. And part of this are, is related to um, very simple measures that could be put into place, um, including, for example, making sure that the coordination takes place in the local language. Uh, this may be done through translation, but also making sure that some of the documents that OCHA produces, uh, such as the Humanitarian Response Plan, is translated into the local language. Um, and therefore, there is a real need for us to consider coordination much more in terms of servicing the national NGOs. We are working to carry out on an annual basis uh, coordination mapping so that we're looking at who's actually participating in coordination um, so that we can better align our coordination mechanisms to the needs of the actual participant. We're also involved with training of local actors um, and trying to ensure that they have have better awareness and knowledge of the coordination mechanism so that they're better able to participate. We're also working through the Global Cluster Coordinators Group, um, which is trying to ensure that all of the clusters themselves are giving uh, suggestions and advice to the field to manage coordination in a way that's much more um, conducive to the, to the real and active engagement of national NGOs. We are pushing that national NGOs, in particular at the operation or subnational level play more of a leadership role. One of the challenges we've seen really is that uh, resources are often not available for NGOs to take on the coordination or the leadership function. In addition, at the OCHA, OCHA is promoting the establishment, where possible, of national NGO consortia. And we have a few countries in which OCHA has identified an OCHA focal point specifically for local and national NGOs so that these agencies have a, have a very uh, clear way to engage with an OCHA office and to find out more about the coordination mechanisms. So from coordination, we, we really recognize that we have a lot more to work to be done to ensure that coordination really is um, meeting the needs of national NGOs. And one of the areas of work in the transformative agenda that we are promoting heavily is that countries undertake annual coordination architecture reviews. And these architecture reviews should fully engage national NGOs and national authorities so that they're able to express their point of view on whether or not the coordination platforms and mechanisms are meeting their needs and whether or not they feel that they are having an active role to play in decision making. Regarding uh, the funding, this is another really important point that uh, in the localization agenda to ensure that national NGOs can access funding. And we do facilitate a collective prioritization and allocation process for the pooled funds, but we are seeing increasingly that national NGOs are being offered an opportunity to receive funds through the pooled fund mechanism. There has been a significant amount of work that's been carried out to um, facilitate and support national NGOs to become eligible for pooled funding and to become familiarized with the allocation process, um, which has also been heavily involved in trying to harmonize and simplify the partner capacity assessment and due diligence process so that that all NGOs, both national and international, are better able to access the pooled funds. And uh, we do see some proof that this engagement is actually delivering results. Currently, the OCHA-led pooled funds are the largest source of directly accessible international funding for national NGOs in humanitarian action. Um, as of August 31st of this year, the pooled funds had allocated $97 million to national NGOs. So there's a huge amount of effort through the pooled funds mechanism as well as through our coordination platform to ensure that national NGOs have not only a greater say in coordination but also have the resources that would enable them to um, both be a, 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 a more active uh, actor in coordination but also in the operational response. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, we now have a couple of questions that have come in for Ian. Uh, so Ian, I'll pose those to you both together. Um, 
first of all, a question from Thomas. Thomas writes, I know that in clusters and the humanitarian country team, uh, ministries are represented, but is there a general rule or a mechanism that defines what in the humanitarian response is coordinated by government structures on the one hand and what is coordinated by OCHA? Uh, so that's the first question from Thomas. And then a second question for you, Ian. Uh, this is from Fedra. Uh, so Fedra is working in the DRC. Uh, and in that context, uh, they have been speaking a lot about trying to raise the profile uh, of various crises globally. And Fedra is wondering, how can NGOs best support OCHA to do this? Are there examples of best practice? So for example, uh, in, in the South Sudanese context, how, how in your view can South Sudanese uh, organizations, people, civil society support OCHA's advocacy in the region? Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Angarad. Uh, I'll take the second question first, if I may, because uh, the question on mechanisms, uh, I'll say a couple of things and then uh, Laurie may want to uh, pick up on, on that. But with regards to uh, raising the profile and how best NGOs can, can support OCHA in doing this, I, I think the, the, the best way I can answer that is to say that a, a, a unified message, a common message, and uh, agreement on how to communicate that message is perhaps the best way uh, that collectively as a humanitarian system uh, we can work together to raise the profile of a, a forgotten crisis or a, a crisis within a crisis such as we're seeing uh, in the Kasai region in, in, in DRC uh, at the moment. So if the humanitarian community can, can get together, if the, the NGO voice and the UN voice and indeed uh, uh, other voices such as the, the media and even the donor voice can be saying the same thing at the same time, uh, I think that's how we have uh, uh, maximum effect. Uh, we have an example of this uh, right now uh, in South Sudan uh, where we're working towards um joint statements uh, about the operating environment uh, to try and get those statements made in different fora uh, at the same time. Uh, I, I, don't, I won't go into details here about what those uh, statements are about, but we've, we've, we've worked very hard as, as a, a community through the HTT to try and work out how do we best use opportunities um, at the UN General Assembly and indeed the Security Council. How do we use local opportunities uh, that we have such as uh, interactions with uh, leadership um, in, in the country. How can we use formal mechanisms uh, that we have, such as uh, reports, uh, statements maybe by the HC, for example, to uh, communicate the same message uh, at the same time um, to uh, the international community at large? And that, that's in terms of raising the profile, particularly around the, the operating environment. With regards to uh, clusters and, and, and ministries, um, I, I would say that our, our goal is to have all stakeholders involved, so of course that involves uh, the host government. Uh, significantly easier perhaps in a, a natural uh, disaster context than in a, a conflict uh, setting such as the one I'm working in now. Let me just say uh, what we're doing uh, in South Sudan uh, and then perhaps Laurie can, can pick it up more, more generally. Uh, we do have uh, uh, line ministry uh, engagement at the cluster level. Um, it's, it's spotty, uh, it's not as consistent as, as we'd like it to be. Um, and uh, we do uh, obviously encourage the cluster lead agencies to work very closely uh, with their line ministries. Um, we don't currently have uh, the involvement of the uh, government uh, beyond that level. Of course, being a, a conflict situation, it creates some specific dynamics uh, in, in South Sudan. But for more generally, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Laurie can add a, f a couple of comments. I think I would just go back to what I said at the very beginning of the presentation when I mentioned UN Resolution uh, 46182, which clearly stipulates that it is the responsibility of national authorities to lead um, humanitarian responses. Now, when does this not come into play? One is when the capacity of the government to do so is inadequate. And secondly, as Ian mentioned, where in, uh, the government may be unable or unwilling to provide assistance in an unbiased and impartial manner. And that's where the UN system and the humanitarian system in terms of coordination really kicks in. I mean, we are seeing increasingly that governments are uh, indeed stepping up and stating that they do want to play the role in coordination, whether it's the lying ministry 
or whether it is the National Disaster Management Authority. And in these cases, the role of OCHA is to really support, where possible, good linkages between the government as well as the other uh, UN agencies and NGOs that may be part of the coordination mechanisms established by the government. Uh, part of the localization agenda is very much about also supporting national authorities, where possible, to take on the coordination function. And that means investing in governments so that they are able to play, um, play that role. I would, however, mention that uh, for OCHA, always the humanitarian principles are at the forefront of all considerations. And so therefore, in any context where humanitarian principles could be compromised, we would uh, stand ready always to ensure that an independent and impartial coordination system was put in place. Thank you, Laurie. Um, we have another question for Jan, actually, and uh, related to integrated missions asked by Maria. And uh, she's asking, particularly in the framework of UN peacekeeping missions, how does OCHA's link with the UN challenge its cooperation with NGOs. What is being done to avoid perceived uh, relation with the political mandate of a UN peacekeeping mission? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Thank you, Maria, for that uh, uh, quite quite uh, difficult question. I, I have to say it is a, a, a challenging area. Um, le let me tell you uh, what we're doing uh, in South Sudan or some of the things that we're doing uh, to try and deal with this uh, tension. And it's a uh, probably a, a partially a healthy tension that, that's built into the system. Um, recognizing that the, the mandate of the UN peacekeeping uh, mission in South Sudan is twofold. Uh, the first part of the mandate is uh, a broad protection of civilians mandate, and the second part of the mandate is uh, creating the conditions for the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, that requires us to have a lot of uh, dialogue with UNMIS, which is the name of the uh, UN mission in, in, in South Sudan. Um, about the uh, the boundary issues, if you like, um, so that our colleagues in the mission understand uh, the realities of humanitarian principles in action, what some of the sensitivities will be uh, for uh, NGO colleagues and indeed uh, UN operational agencies. Uh, but equally, that those of us in the humanitarian uh, world understand what some of the, the opportunities and, and challenges are for the uh, peacekeeping mission. So we're actually in South Sudan right now uh, in the middle of a, a significant uh, piece of work. Uh, we discovered that over the last several years, uh, lots of documents uh, and agreements have, have been written uh, uh, governing or describing our, how humanitarians and the peacekeeping mission work in that context. Um, but some of them were a little out of date. Some of them have been developed by humanitarians and not necessarily signed off by the mission or, or vice versa. So we're going through all of that uh, normative work, if you like, uh, and hoping that uh, uh, in the next, well, planning, uh, that within the next uh, couple of months we'll, we'll have that work finished and we'll have if you like, uh, that gives us a, a playbook or a rule book for engagement between uh, the mission and the humanitarian community. That doesn't mean that the challenges will, will disappear and that we won't have issues uh, going forwards, uh, but it does mean that we'll have a framework uh, within which to uh, have the conversation about those issues as they arrive. So, for example, when a troop contributing country uh, brings with it some funds for quick impact projects, and, and, and some of those are done uh, either in areas of, of uh, the country where we wish they weren't done or they're duplicative of uh, the work of humanitarian agencies. Uh, I think it's as, as critical for us to ensure uh, uh, that we understand, humanitarians understand, uh, what peacekeeping missions have to offer and also the challenges and constraints they face. It, that's just as important as us uh, helping peacekeeping missions understand uh, uh, humanitarian principles and, and what that means for us. It really is about a dialogue and about recognizing that fundamentally we're, we're trying to do the same thing. We're just using slightly different tools uh, to go about it. And by the same thing, I mean serving the people in need in, in the context where we're based. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Ian, for that. Now we're coming close to the end of our session, but we are going to try to push through with two more questions 
questions. We have a couple of great questions, first for Wahyu and then Mohammed, and then we'll ask all four of our guest speakers uh, just to give very brief 20-30 uh, second uh, remarks uh, at the very end. So uh, next, going to Wahyu with a question submitted by Rick. Um, the question is, what is the process by which OCHA links the country-level cluster system to the host country's disaster management system? Uh, what have you observed uh, in this regard, Wahyu, and what can you share with us? Yeah, uh, this is quite a long uh, process to, to bring uh, the national uh, or the country level cluster system. Uh, I think it's linked also with the, the, the OCHA strategy to, to facing out from Indonesia. I think that's what why uh, what I'm observed. Uh, because again is is the idea is to to have the the responsibility in emergency response uh, taken by the the national government as the main responsibility in in, in this case. So uh, it's at the moment, it's stated under uh, regulation under the uh, Ministry of Disaster Management uh, Agency, which is uh, a coordinating uh, ministry or agency that uh, they they function or they mandate is to coordinate uh, other ministry in uh, disaster management, including at the preparedness uh, uh, activity. So. Yeah, uh, the rule of OCHA at the time uh, is uh, to bring up the discussion to the first to the HCT and then to bring uh, the discussion to the the coordination uh, uh, what you call coordination meeting, the general coordination meeting, a uh, and after afterward the the INGO start to uh, provide uh, input how the the national cluster system should look like how it link with the the international cluster when uh, when uh, the disaster happened for instance like that but uh, until now we we still don't have any experience uh, in activating uh, both of them whether the, the the national cluster and the international cluster since uh, uh, since this uh, what you call like five years we not experience a very large uh, of uh, disaster in Indonesia, but uh, yeah, the discussion still, still, still going on whether a uh, this national cluster are uh, effective enough and are the, the the Indonesian government ready to uh, to take over the the cluster system when uh, dealing with the the large scale of emergency. So I uh, hope that answer your question. It does. Thank you very much, uh, Wahyu. And if we can finish with the uh, uh, last question uh, with uh, for Mohammed before wrapping up, uh, can you elaborate, Mohammed, about organizational capacity that you mentioned during your presentation and how that's hampering effective coordination? Okay, um, I, I don't remind exactly what, which organization capacity is, 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 is um, meant here, but um, let me give an example uh, of, of, of our context. We have, um, well, we are doing remote management here uh, from Turkey, and we are coordinating the response across the border. So that uh, very challenging and uh, we have many NGOs and local partners and uh, who are who only exist for example within the within Syria they don't have offices they don't have representatives in, in in Turkey and also we have other small organizations who don't exist in Gaziantep but in other Turkish cities uh, th that really affects the coordination and and um, they can't be uh, up to date with all the uh, issues going on here I, I, I think this is why uh, there should be an investment in, in local coordination systems as well, uh, where local actors can do uh, coordination for the response on their own as well. Thank you. All right, and thank you very much. We've come to the end of our time now, so we're going to uh, ask all of our speakers once more to just offer very brief uh, final words. We'll go in the following order to Lori, Wahyu, Mohammed, and Ian. So, uh, Lori, thanks so much for being with us. Over to you for uh, final words. 
I believe that uh, in the future we're going to see a shift in how coordination is carried out. I believe we're going to move towards uh, much more context-specific coordination that's more flexible, that builds off of local and existing capacity, and that takes into account the contributions of a wide range of actors, not only traditional humanitarian partners such as the government, NGOs, or the UN, but also civil society and the private sector. And I would really encourage NGOs to play an active and a vocal role in helping to define the coordination systems in their country that works best for them. Um, uh, this can include local NGO consortia. It can include um, different and new types of mechanisms, more area-based coordination systems, for example. I would also encourage you to reach out to o OCHA uh, in your countries when you need support to access funds through the pool fund mechanisms or for capacity building, and especially to see how we can support you to take more of a leadership role in the coordination mechanisms in which you are participating. Thank you. And thank you, Lori. And now to Wahyu, some final thoughts you'd like to leave us with today. Yeah, uh, I think I just want to say that having a, uh, a good relation uh, with, with OCHA colleague, it uh, will definitely uh, give your uh, response uh, what you call it, more easier because you will have will unlock a lot of the the key that uh, you might think that uh, you're not able to to solve by uh, attending the the coordination meeting that uh, held by OCHA or the government uh, system in 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 the country. Thank you, Wahyu. And now over to Mohammed. Any uh, final takeaway you can share with us? Yeah, final final point is the role of civil society in general uh, and local civil society actors. It's important here to know that the, the local actors generally uh, have challenges to, to, to apply principled humanitarian response within the context and, 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 and their countries. So it's important when we go to representation and to advocacy and uh, uh, other uh, humanitarian platforms, we focus on working and coordinating with those actors who are the principal humanitarian actors because we otherwise create a context where uh, we have civil society organizations who might not be principal humanitarian actors in, uh, uh, trying to, to, to take rules uh, of the humanitarian actors who, who are like strictly principled actors, and, and that, that, that creates some sensitivity as well. Thank you. And thank you, Mohammed. Last but not least, Ian, uh, over to you for some parting thoughts. Thank you, Angela. I would just say two things. Uh, one is to really focus on building relationships. Uh, we need to invest uh, more in relationships and perhaps less in, in systems because that's really how we how we get things done uh, is by building the trust uh, that comes from building those relationships. And the second would be to focus on the results, uh, as I said earlier, the why we're doing what we're doing, to remember that it's not about us. It's about uh, the disaster effect of people, the people that we're serving. And I think if we keep that uh, in our sights, uh, then we'll all do uh, a, f a fine job uh, on behalf of those disaster affected people. Very good. Thank you very much, Ian. Thanks to all of our speakers for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, some very important points having come out of this session, and we're so pleased uh, that everyone was able to be a part of the discussion. Uh, now, we're wrapping things up. I'd like to note that both the audio and video recordings uh, and all of the mentioned resources will be available in the next few days on the event webpage. And once they're translated, the video recording will also be available with subtitles in both French and Arabic. And also to add that uh, IGVA will put later a briefing paper, as you may already know, on the topic discussed uh, today, and it will be available in English, French, and Arabic. You can also now register for the two final webinars that we'll be organizing together under this learning stream on humanitarian coordination by clicking on the banners you see there on the screen. On the 5th of October, we'll be sharing information and potential implications of the so-called new way of working, a new policy approach adopted by eight UN humanitarian and development entities aspiring to work towards collective outcomes across both the humanitarian and development sectors. And then on the 9th of November, we'll be hosting our final session in the series looking at alternative coordination.
nation models in the humanitarian world. And a quick reminder also about our previous session, the one on the global uh, humanitarian coordination architecture and the coordination architecture at the country level and the NGO fora and consortia that we had in the previous months. You can access the audio and video recordings of all these events by clicking on each banner that appear on your screen. And uh, we will also publish briefing papers for all e each of the topics in the coming months. And with a final note, I'd like to thank once again uh, all of our participants for their proactive involvement and very interesting questions today, as well as the speakers for their valuable input and to the teams both in ICFA and PHAP uh, for making this event possible. I'd also uh, really like to underline our thanks to ICFA uh, for uh, working with us uh, on this series, for, for putting together the idea of the series, and also to the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs for their support to the Geneva Humanitarian Connector, which has enabled this interactive online platform to move ahead. Uh, so thanks, everyone, um, for being here. Uh, Please do fill in the survey after the event so we continue to improve the experience for the next sessions. And with that, uh, this is Anharad signing off. <laughs>